looks like we're uh, good to go in the back there, so. Okay. PowerPoint things have crashed. Just a moment. Yeah, hold on. All right. We're good. All right, thank you, Damon. So, um, actually, I'm wearing kind of two hats uh, today, uh, both uh, NVIDIA and uh, Kronos. So, uh, but you'll see that they're kind of intertwined. And uh, Damon has asked me to give kind of a broad industry overview of what the silicon vendors are doing uh, right now that's relevant to the uh, AR uh, community. And the, I do understand that I, I am between you and beer, so we will make this timely. So, thank you, thank you. Beer is not till 5.10. All right, right. So the, uh, the good news is that the silicon vendors are doing a lot. Um, that's directly relevant to the AR community. The most um, obvious one, I guess, and there's been a lot of um, kind of uh, press about it, is just the CPU and GPU performance, RAW, uh, 3D, uh, Polygon pushing performance. Uh, all of the silicon vendors are making good progress. The uh, OpenGL ES is the um, uh, API that's typically used on most of the mobile OSs today uh, to access the 3D GPU. And we're up to the point where mobile devices even have HDMI connectors. You can plug them in, use a wireless controller, and it's pretty hard to tell the difference between them and a console. In some cases, uh, mobile devices are actually no now beginning to outperform uh, the current generation uh, of, of consoles. So for 3D augmentations and the 3D data display, uh, I think you know, the silicon roadmap is well served. Um, but, of course, there's a lot more to augmented reality. That's uh, the joy and the challenge of augmented reality. And vision uh, is becoming a first-class citizen uh, in the sensor input uh, array. Uh, handling, um, uh, handling vision for um, uh, computational photography, uh, treating the camera as uh, a sensor and doing a lot of image and vision processing to do that not only at high performance but at low power uh, is a key part of the augmented reality uh, puzzle. A sensor fusion, we just heard Mike and John talk about uh, sensor fusion. Uh, it definitely has the attention of uh, the silicon vendors too. We're trying to figure out what we can do from the bottom of the stack up uh, from the silicon perspective to help uh, with sensor fusion. And although we won't have time to talk about it today, uh, HTML and WebGL uh, holds the promise in the next few years, I think, of not only providing uh, access to all this great silicon uh, capability and performance, but doing it in a cross-platform way. We're not quite there yet, but that's uh, a topic for uh, another day. So I'm going to kind of focus on this talk for what are we doing at the silicon level, and more importantly for the developers, what are we doing at the API level to uh, give you guys uh, access to this emerging uh, performance uh, in the silicon SOCs. So uh, I'm from NVIDIA, so I'm using the NVIDIA roadmap because I'm allowed to. This is the public uh, roadmap. Uh, you might know Tegra. It's in a bunch of devices. We're currently shipping Tegra 3, uh, which is used in a bunch of uh, phones, the H HTC One X and uh, the uh, Asus Transformer Prime are perhaps the best known phones and tablets that are currently shipping with the quad core uh, Tegra 3. Um, but this is the roadmap, and it's kind of looking forward is the interesting part. We're already uh, outperforming on many of the benchmarks, the Core 2 Duo. You know, that's a MacBook Air. Um, but we, over the next three years, we're forecasting that you know, the aggregate of CPU and GPU performance is going to be uh, another 30 times. So there's you know, a lot of performance coming in these mobile form factors in, the, in the, the power envelope that will fit in mobile phones and tablets. So that's a, a great opportunity. OK, problem solved. Beer, bye. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen this, this hype cycle used a couple times already today. And you know, the, this is the 2012 version of the Gartner hype cycle. And it's saying that augmented reality is five to 10 years away. And you can see, kind of see why they might think that. I mean, it's 
when, when you use an augmented reality app, your phone gets really hot. You know, is it really a useful experience that we can deliver today on today's silicon? But for some cases, yes, but the broad, we haven't really broken out into a mainstream app that people want to use over and over again. But refuse to believe that it's going to take 10 years. And the best, my favorite quote is, you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And we, the silicon community, need to play our part in figuring out what functionality we, we need to implement and accelerate, and how do we expose it to the developers through the appropriate APIs. And why is AR tricky? Well, most of the APIs, most of the processing that we've done at the silicon level has either been input or more normally output. We have an output, you know, a GPU that pumps out 3D pixels. We have output for audio. You know, we have output to HDMI. Um, we have cameras, which are input. But typically, the two never need to talk to each other. And augmented reality is where both input and output come together, mixed in with uh, composition, where you have to take video and, and graphics and mix it all together. It means that every part of an SOC can be active, and they all have to work together in uh, seamless harmony. So it's an interesting challenge. So do we have the APIs that will let us do it? Well, the answer is we're building them right now. In the past, we haven't really had the APIs for advanced augmented reality, but we are getting a lot closer. So the hi a brief history of API uh, development. The original uh, APIs for like graphics and compute were developed on uh, desktop workstations and then PCs you know, 20 years, 10 years ago. But now, today, the main focus of a lot of innovation and investment is the mobile space. And so we have mobile versions of those APIs. So we have OpenGL ES for embedded systems, which is uh, a slimmed down uh, version of its uh, OpenGL uh, granddaddy. And we have these APIs that give good functionality and have been engineered for low power. But typically, they, they just operate standalone. You have a video API, and you have a graphics API, and no one's really figured out how the two work together in a seamless way. That's what we're working on right now, a series of APIs that not only provide you access to the input sensors, including the camera and the motion sensors, but let you interoperate those sensor inputs together with all the processing and output processing uh, in the SOC. And I'm going to touch on just a couple of those um, in the few minutes I have today. And augmented reality, just to fact, no, just sync up, what, what do I mean by augmented reality? Well, for this conversation, I'm talking about vision-based augmented reality, where we're taking a camera, uh, we're doing tracking, so we're, we're generating the camera to scene transform. We're taking in other sensors, too, to create uh, the, uh, the, the scene to camera transform so we can do 3D augmentations and composite them together. So what are the APIs that we need for doing each of those processing steps? Well, we have OpenMax AL is a uh, cross-industry standard. It ships as standard part of Android. Um, it's an early version on Android, but it's uh, extensible. It lets you connect a range of inputs, uh, do stream processing on it, and output. And for augmented reality applications, the Interesting ones are you can bring in a camera, you can do low-level low image processing, and you can output it to multiple places. You can stream that video to your CPU or GPU, so you can do tracking and you can do composition uh, in a very efficient way. And the, the OpenMax AL uh, camera module is extensible. So we're currently gathering in requirements as to how we should extend uh, the camera module for the AR community. And we'd love to get your feedback uh, here at, at the show. Uh, kind of things that you don't normally get for a normal you know, photography type application. You know, querying a lot more information about the, the camera, including how it's spatially arranged on the device and in relation to the other sensors. Uh, doing ROI uh, extraction, um, FCAM type multiple exposure control, um, and you know, much more control on the data in which you receive the output from the camera. The next big thing that um, we're working on is um, sensor fusion 
and Mike gave a great, great overview, the, the value of not looking at each of the sensors individually, but looking at them uh, as an aggregate. We're definitely finding that a lot of uh, ISVs want to use multiple sensors. These mobile phones are packed full of sensors. We need to enable the uh, developer community to easily access the power of these devices. They need to be synchronized. And for example, in AR, we need to synchronize the motion sensors to the camera, and that's not a widely solved problem yet. We want the apps to be portable between not just different devices, but different operating systems. And really, we need the application developers typically not to have to be a sensor fusion expert to uh, use uh, the sensors in sophisticated ways. So Kronos is defining a stream input uh, API, uh, which is a high-level API. It doesn't force the application vendor to access the individual sensors. And it enables an opportunity for the sensor vendors to innovate underneath a higher API, typically than the OS vendors would provide. So the sensor fusion value the inbuilt knowledge of how best to use combinations of sensors can be packaged up into smart middleware and made available portably to developers. So from the developer point of view, it's really simple. It's a high-level API. You request semantic information. It can be like give me skeleton tracking information for a connect type game. Or it can be something like, am I in, a, in an elevator? Or am I being carried in a pocket? or a backpack, uh, you can make these devices uh, very aware of their situation. Stream input lets you connect up a middleware graph that does all the processing that you need, and the application gets back the semantic information that it requested you know, in, a, in a magical way. Now, sounds quite an interesting problem, but we have some good folks working on it, PrimeSense, SoftKinetic, um, Sensor Platforms, Transgaming, these companies are coming together to create this cross-platform uh, API. We are expecting a stable spec in the third quarter of, of this year. Um, and we're focusing on motion sensors and cameras, depth and 2D cameras. Uh, the last API I'm going to talk about is OpenVL. Uh, it's so new we don't have a logo yet, uh, but it's for accelerated vision. Uh, processing. A lot of folks here, I'm sure, use OpenCV, and a lot of the silicon vendors um, have been looking how to best provide acceleration for libraries like OpenCV. The problem is that OpenCV is very large. It has a lot of great functionality. It makes it hard for the silicon vendors to go around every one of the thousand functions and figure out which ones are actually being used and to put the resources in to uh, accelerate every single one. So we're going to try and meet the OpenCV community halfway by defining a hardware abstraction layer called OpenVL, which is a well-defined set of um, acceleration functions for vision processing in a defined API. So the silicon vendors can then go and implement that set of functions, and we can implement libraries like OpenCV uh, over the top of that in a very uh, targeted way, and then suddenly we have accelerated OpenCV across many different uh, platforms. We're aiming for a spec in 2012. That's a draft spec in 2012. And it's not just limited to OpenCV. I mean, any other libraries can use OpenVL, um, or um, applications, the more sophisticated applications, might, might choose to use OpenVL uh, directly. That's entirely up to the, the developer. So how does it all come together? So my kind of tie-up slide. So if we have an augmented reality pipeline, um, what are the things we need to do? And what are the APIs that we could use to create an augmented reality app using portable open standards? Well, we need camera processing. So we need to control the camera, do low-level image pre-processing. That's the domain of OpenMax AL. We can use OpenMax AL to route the data. Uh, so for example, we can provide monochrome data up to the tracker. We can provide RGB data processed at, processed at a different resolution to the compositor. And uh, OpenMax AL gives us that routing capability. We can use OpenVL uh, to do our vision tracking. 
uh, we need to combine that with all the other positional uh, sensors and other sensors in the system. Uh, that sensor fusion is through stream input. Uh, we can do the 3D rendering in much more advanced ways than just overlaying the 3D uh, over the video. We can mix and match in much more um, uh, uh, sophisticated ways using the power of the GPU through OpenGL ES. Uh, we have another API that I haven't mentioned in detail, but EGL lets you stream data from uh, video to GPUs very efficiently. And then last but not least, we have audio rendering with full 3D positional audio um, in OpenSL ES, which is another API that is a standard part of Android. So we've only been able to draw that diagram using open standards um, for the last few months. So it's kind of cutting edge what we're, we're doing. And I think you'll see implementations of all these APIs beginning to ship towards the end of this year and into next year. Is that's the kind of time frame uh, that we're talking about. So that's, that's it. Um, the year's getting closer. So my summary is now looking forward. Now NVIDIA is helping to drive these open standards to enable the developer community um, to do fully accelerated AR with sensor fusion, with sophisticated camera control. So our aim is to get everything we can off the CPU onto accelerated hardware, because that way we can reach 60 frames a second and we can do it at low power levels. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're going to talk about that more as a panel on that specific subject tomorrow. So uh, be there or be square. But to answer your question, the different OS vendors have different, uh, enable different amounts of um, um, innovation. And actually, Android is on the open end because, and, and to the credit, Google have been adopting open standards where it makes sense. Perhaps not always as immediately as we'd like, but they, they kind of get there in the end. No, OpenGL ES, OpenMax AL, OpenSL ES, EGL, all these things are now shipping as a standard part of Android. And in Android, we have the NDK, and we can extend the NDK. So we're not blocked from shipping these right away. And hopefully, now that we can prove to Google the value of these APIs and that they will make it into the system. Stream input, though, in particular, we've been very careful to design it so it will layer over the uh, OS APIs on iOS, on Windows, on Android. So we don't need adoption by the OS vendor in that particular case to get it everywhere quickly. Obviously, we can do more if it's embedded deeper into the system, but we can add a lot of value quickly. Hi. <clears throat> Has uh, NVIDIA done any work to um, implement the GPU processing for planoptic camera arrays? Uh, and do you, do you see planoptic camera arrays possibly showing up in consumer devices and, and being used for motion tracking in much the same way as the uh, structured light and the other infrared or emitters? Yeah, I think planoptic cameras definitely have a, a place. I mean, the, the different types of processing you can do, the packaging advantages to make it uh, attractive for many form factors of mobile devices. We haven't shipped any production devices with uh, panoptic cameras yet. But the, the kinds of processing that we're building in, I think it, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to handle that kind of processing and that kind of camera device when they're production ready.